company which was Alp Sport and when I did that I put together a group of products and was sewing in a little room that I built on the side of our 10 by 45 Detroiter trailer uh, and I started that out as a mail order business and every day I'd go to the post office and I never had an order <laughs> and I just kept going and going and going but finally I got one order and I figured you know this isn't going to do it so then I took some product and I went on a trip to California and I sold it to various companies in California and made it and shipped it to them. And that was the beginning of Elf Sport. And uh, we also made, uh, designed and made the first smooth outer shell down jacket. And whenever it uh, gets really cold in Boulder, you'll see people running around in old Elf Sport and Omaha parkas. They still have them, they still wear them. And that was the same thing with the Camp 7 product with the Camp 7 jackets. Uh, I sold Alpsport to a uh, recreation company in New York 
And after being with them for a couple of years, I quit and I started Camp 7. I uh, had to close Camp 7 down because I owed the bank a million six fifty at one time and they wanted their money. So I had to sell some of my assets and we closed that down and I started a company called the Horse of Course. And uh, the reason I started the Horse of Course was because horses tear their horse blankets up. We made horse blankets and stall drapes. And there was always people in the horse business changing and always needing stall drapes, but the horse business for horse blankets uh, was a constant replenishment business. And we also washed and repaired horse blankets. I retired 12 years ago. I still have a sewing machine, and I still do some personal sewing for myself. And that's about it. <laughs> This is Penny Cunningham. This is Jerry Cunningham's daughter. Jerry's in Mexico right now. And Penny lives in Denver. Hi. Um, yes, as he said, I'm, I'm here representing Jerry, both Jerry and evidently Jerry Posen's makes and couldn't make it tonight. Um, and I also have put together the family tree out there. And please, please, any of you who have any connections, <coughs> Um, you're free to make corrections, you're free to add names, add um, any information you want. And if any of you feel like you have a, um, the kind of information you'd like somebody to contact you to find out more about what you know about the history, there's also a place for name and contact information there. Um, I know the folks in Golden are looking forward to maybe getting some contacts tonight and probably the people up on the hill too. So um, anyway, many people are not aware, you know, there's been a lot of hoopla about the 10th Mountain Division in the last few years around here. And Dad's name is almost always left out because he was not fond of the war and did not go to 10th Mountain reunions and all. And every once in a while, you know, somebody on NPR will mention, oh, and then there was Jerry Cunningham. But mostly they mentioned the, the ski resort folks. Um, but Dad was a 10th Mountain Division guy, and when he was up at Camp Hale, he looked around and he said, who's the shortest guy here, because that's who I want to share a tent with. <laughs> and many of you probably know who that was. That's Bob Schwartz, who has a store over here on Pearl. <laughs> so Bob became not only a close family friend, but he was also um, a, a dealer for many years, and then continued on after Jerry was, the name was going off in its corporate way. Um, but anyway, so that's the that's how Bob Schwartz, it's really fun. I'm working on Dad's 10th Mountain Division letters right now, and it's really fun to see the first mention of this short guy <laughs> and to know who that was and, and what a great friend he became. Um, after the war, Dad started out by helping his father, who was a, a photography innovator, and created what was one of the first, um, put the film in one end and the printed pictures come out the other end, but there was a big gap between what my grandfather did and when those actually became um, popular. Grandpa never quite made a financial success of it. But Dad did start that right after the war, started to help him with some prototypes, and then said, no, I just got to get out of here. He, he and Mother had married right before the war. In fact, my grandfather had to walk up the Hudson River into the wilderness to get Mother and Dad out from their honeymoon because Dad's orders had come. So. Um, <laughs> They, they didn't have much time together before the war, so they made up for it after the war. They're still together 50, however many years later. Um, so they, they knew that they wanted to live somewhere out in the wilderness, and um, they were driving on their way to California, actually stopped up near Ward um, to eat lunch, um, looked over and saw this really pretty little meadow, and a guy came by, I think it was Roy Fling, I think is who they said it was, drove, drove by. And um, they waved him down and said, any land for sale around here? And they said, yeah, that meadow right over there. And um, they said, OK. So they were trying to sell, I think, 120 acres. Now, mother and dad at this point had $600 to their name, plus the old Model A that they were traveling around in, plus the nylon, um, the, the football pant material and the nylon cord and stuff that they had picked up in New York to start sewing more of dad's packs because he kind of thought that's what he wanted to do. He did a lot of designing, lying in 10th Mountain Division tents during the war. He did a lot of designing. Most of the actual designs that he drew and sent to Mother were unfortunately lost along the way or possibly nabbed because somebody thought that they were important military plants or something. They never knew, but they, 
didn't make it home, but it was all in Dad's head. So they bought, um, they didn't have enough money to buy 120 acres, so they kept talking to the guy whose name I can't remember. It's in the book out there. Um, eventually, they, he said, well, how much do you have? They said $600. He said, I'll give you the 20 acres with the meadow and the hill behind it for $600. So they bought that beautiful, beautiful place for $600. And I would die to get it back again, but not going to happen. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it now belongs to a very lovely couple who are keeping up um, the two houses that mother and dad built on the land are beautifully kept. The one of which was the little sandstone base house in which dad used to have a forge, a, sew, a cutting table, a sewing machine, a wife, a gas furnace, and twin boys who slept in the dresser drawer. So it was a very, very small little place to start with. By the time I came along five years later, they built a bigger one. And that was the start of Jerry Mountain Sports. And to speak for the missing Meg Hansen here, um, about 1959-1960, um, the Hansons were Antiochians like my parents. Well, neither of my parents actually made it through more than a year, but um, <laughs> the war sort of intervened. But they had met the Hansons and the, uh, another family, some of you may know, the Metcalfs at Antioch. And Meg, of course, as you, I'm sure you're aware, is a, a stupendous businesswoman. And um, when Dad realized that the kitty carriers needed completely different marketing and he kept having to send out all these expensive catalogs, that with all these mountaineering equipment to people who really just wanted the kitty carriers. So that's when Jerry Designs was a spin-off, and Meg took that and did a marvelous job so that my daughter, who was the, um, the last addition to that generation of our family because she was adopted, and she could still go around in malls and go up to people and say, that thing, you're carrying your baby, and my grandpa designed that. And it was a real point of pride for her, and it was just really neat, and I'm grateful to make for that. So that's kind of a brief history. Don't miss the, the family tree out there. And if any of you are interested in the history, write down Bruce Johnson's website and look into his books. The one for Jerry is there. I don't have the cross line one. but. Um, He's working on Hollywood Bar now, I believe, is the third book he's working on. So if you're really interested in the history of gear, Bruce Johnson's website is a great place to go. Bruce Johnson's in Olympia, Washington, just by the way. I don't know how to introduce this guy. I only worked for him for six months. I left. <laughs> Jim Cat, Hollywood Bar. Thank you. I think it's no. not. It's been very nice, but it would be very nice if there was a mic that worked. Do you need an hour for the I, I think I can speak loudly enough. Yeah. Oh, yes. Will that work? Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I mean that sincerely. It's been uh, 33 years uh, since leaving Boulder. And uh, to give you a thumbnail sketch of, of my involvement, I was going to school, Joanne and I moved from Chicago in 1967 to go to the MBA program in, uh, at the University of Denver. And we fell in love with the area and wanted to stay, like so many of you. And uh, so I was out looking for a job. And one of the profs at the University of Denver was a fellow by the name of Dwayne Pettyjohn. I don't know if Dwayne is still in the area or around, but I went to Dwayne and I said, what's in Boulder? I looked around Denver. and. Colorado Springs, and now I want to go to Boulder and see what's there. And he said, well, there's really, there's IBM, and there's uh, ball research and a few. And he said, would, would you be interested in buying a little business? And the thought had never crossed my mind, of course. And I said, well, yeah, sure. And he said, well, I have a friend by the name of Dick Buskirk. And Dick is working with a couple by the name of Leroy and Alice Hollybar. Who, he said, are you familiar with Hollybar Mountaineering? And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, well, it's a little mom and pop company. Uh, they have a shop on the hill in Bozeman, er, excuse me, in Boulder. <laughs> and they have uh, a little shop in, in Denver. They make downfield sleeping bags and what have you. Would you like to meet them? And I said, I'd love to. So I met Roy and Alice, and I said it was just good chemistry. It was simpatico, and, and we hit it off. Uh, Alice was fighting cancer at the time, and this was early 1968. And they said, we want to get rid of the business. Uh, 
because we want to take some time off and do a little traveling while we still can. So in spring of 1968, I purchased the company from Roy and Alice, and I said they handed me the keys and left, and I truly didn't know a sleeping bag from a woodpecker. But <laughs> you, you have a tendency to learn fast uh, when, you're, when you have to. And, and more importantly, because of the fact that Boulder was such a desirable place to, to be, that there were, uh, of course, a lot of young people here that knew the business and, and wanted to be in the, in the business. And secondly, there were a lot of young people, faces out there, Steve Cornwell and many of them, John Senatore, that came from uh, different parts of the country and wanted to be in Boulder and be in the recreation business. So we really, it was a, a fantastic experience as far as gathering the people and, and uh, putting together a company that was, was a delightful experience. As I said, I didn't know uh, really the industry. I knew a little, little bit about business. Uh, John Whitbeck, God bless him, dragged me up the third flat iron and, and tried to take me out into the country and the, and the mountains and show me a little bit about uh, the outdoors, which <laughs> undoubtedly was helpful. I said in those days, uh, and Roy now Alice had grown up in Germany, and I, I have a catalog that I found of Hollywood from 1954 when in those days they just bought uh, mostly climbing hardware from Europe, imported it, and sold it. And it was just in the early, about 60, that Alice started uh, cutting on the ping pong table in their basement on Grandview, uh, just a few blocks over here. and. Uh, started making, uh, I think Holly Bar, when George said as far as Jerry and the teardrop pack and, and George's packs, probably the Mountain Parker was Alice's yeah, real uh, <coughs> item that, that defined the company. That and, and Downfield Sleeping Bags were the, were the big items. I said in those days, uh, one of my first jobs was when the liquor stores opened in Boulder, I would go collect boxes for that day's shipments, so that if anybody ordered a sleeping bag from Hollybar, it usually said Gallo or Jack Daniels or something on the box, because that was, that was part of the routine. Uh, the other thing that, that is so vivid to memory in those days was that we had about nine people in production, and because of the uh, especially CU engineering, we had a lot of foreign students, and the people in production, it was like a little United Nations. Uh, they were all women, but we had Janaki Domley, who was a little gal from India, who was, did all the down work. She, had, she looked like a chicken when she'd come out of the room with all the <laughs> down and feathers. We had people from Germany, from Syria, from uh, even a couple Americans. But, uh, <laughs> but it was incredible, uh, from literally all over the country. Uh, I didn't do anything different than Roy and Alice, but just stayed with their formula, if you will, of attempting to produce a, a quality product and to uh, sell it via the direct mail catalogs and through the stores uh, here and in uh, Denver. And then we later we had a store in Aspen over the summer. We opened Colorado Springs and Fort Collins, and we just kind of grew as we could. Uh, one quick story that I thought of the other day that when I read in the paper and, and Gary Neptune had said as far as the old days and little stores, in 1972, I think it was, I wrote it down, if you remember when Skylab was launched and Martin Marietta in Denver had played a major role in Skylab. And if you recall, they sent up, the, they were going to have two rocket mission, two crews, and they sent up Skylab and, the, and one solar panel didn't deploy. And they had to have a heat shield. They had to come up with something. And they had the rocket sitting on the pad down in Florida and the crew waiting. And they said, we've got to develop a heat shield. So Mark Marietta and all of the people in, in aerospace come up with a design. Well, a couple engineers at Mark Marietta were backpackers. And they had a, one of our tents, and, and I think all of us in those days used shot cord and the, the tents, to, uh, the poles, as you're aware, to fold up, etc. And they said, why don't we have, if, see if Holly Bar would, we'll give a design and we'll have them make it out of ripstop nylon and the tent poles, and then test that design to see if that prototype works, and then 
see if we can send it up in the sky raft. So the phone rang <coughs> just shortly before noon, and they called Terry Mowbray, who was a fellow who was handling new products, etc. And they said, this is Mark Marietta, and we're calling, and we need your help. And we'd like you to design a prototype. If we bring you a design, can you make this thing? And Terry said, well, why don't I call you after lunch? I'm just on the way to lunch. And the guy said, uh, look, we're kind of in a hurry. <laughs> got the rocket on the bed and the people ready to go. We, we hope you cancel lunch. And Terry said, okay. And the guy kind of gave him the outline over the phone and Terry said, well, look, uh, I got to tell you, this thing could cost four or $500. <laughs> I, I have always, I've always had this mental picture in my mind of the guy taking the phone and saying to his people, it could cost as much as four or five years. <laughs> Should we go ahead with it? <laughs> anyway, we, we built the prototype and, and uh, they didn't use it. Uh, some, other, some other aerospace company got the job, but uh, again, it was the life I was with Hollywood until 1975 and sold uh, the company to SC Johnson, Johnson Wax, and uh, was with the company for one year after that and then uh, moved to Bozeman, Montana. But, it was a fabulous experience, I mean, a once in a lifetime. Everyone should be so lucky as to have had the experience of working with the people. And it was all people, the, the people within our company, and the suppliers and customers was a, a great fling. So thank you. I didn't meet John until three days ago on the phone. So he gets to introduce himself. But everybody said I had to have him on this panel. And I don't know why. I'm the uh, sort of the second wave of the entrepreneur in this business. Um, like Jim Tack, we didn't actually start the businesses that we started to uh, work for. Uh, I was working in New York City for a uh, a company in the consumer packaged goods business, Vic Chemical Company, and they uh, assigned me to Binghamton, New York. And I went up there to help reorganize the company, but I wanted to always go back to my old hometown, Ithaca, uh, where I grew up and where I went to school. Uh, I wanted to go back there because there was a leisure time conglomerate by the name of General Recreation that bought the Ithaca Gun Company. And I thought it would be nice to go back there in a marketing job, and I walked in on the president one day and I said, I, I want to come to work for you in Ithaca. And he says, uh, you're six months too soon or you're six months too late. He said, I just laid off my marketing department. We're having a tough quarter. He said, uh, just stay in touch, which I did. And six months later, I contacted him and he said, you know, I don't have any problems in Ithaca, New York. My biggest headache right now is in Boulder, Colorado. He said, I bought a company out there by the name of Outsport. We changed the name to Alpine Designs. And I've got two fantastic guys back there, but they hated the first guy that I sent out there to run it. He was an egomaniac, and it finally got to the point where they said, either he goes or we go. And fortunately, somebody in a corporate situation back in New York decided it was smart to have George Lamb and Chuck Eaton stay at Alpine Designs. But he said, I got one problem here. He said, you know, the, the last guy had an MBA and he was from the East and I sent him out there and, and they just didn't get along. His name was Hornbacher and my name is Heinbach. <laughs> and he says, and you have an MBA. He says, how can I send you out there? I said, let me talk to these guys and see if we get along. And the only time that we could ever arrange to get together and at least talk was when they were on their way to a Spoga show in Cologne, Germany, and they were changing planes in Kennedy Airport. And I said, well, I'll meet them. And so I go out to Kennedy Airport, and in between planes, First of all, these two guys from Boulder, Colorado, where I had never been before, they get off the plane, and of course, they had had a few drinks on the plane. <laughs> and they walked out, you know, and hi, how are you, you know, and so on. Well, 
we sat down and we talked for an hour, and for some reason they thought it might be okay if John Heinbach came out here to uh, be president of, of Alpine Designs. And it's the best thing that ever happened to me. I left New York City, I came out here, worked with George for a couple of years, and he, he left after a year. He said, I can't put up with this corporate stuff. This is, this is ridiculous. So he went off and started Camp 7. And I stayed for another year until they wanted to transfer me to the new corporate headquarters in Albuquerque. And I said, well, I just got to Boulder. Why do I want to go to Albuquerque, New Mexico? I love this place. And they said, you're coming down. They walked in and announced that they had moved me. They put my associate guy who was heading manufacturing, put him in charge and everything. I said, well, he's going to crash and burn. He won't last very long. I said, this is crazy. I got to get out of here. So I went and talked to George. And he, by that time, had developed his great line of sleeping bags. And I said, let me help you from a marketing standpoint. I'm a marketing guy, he's a production guy. So we got together, we built the company for a couple of years. We diversified into some really good down jackets and down vests so that we, we, had, we had some products that would sell year round. And uh, we put Camp 7 on the, on the map. But then I sort of got itchy and I said, geez, I'd like to get in and have my own company. Uh, George and I were partners, but he was the majority partner. I said, I think I'd like to have my own company, and I think there's a growing area in this whole area of outdoor recreation that's, uh, that's growing. It, uh, there's some very smart guys that have started their companies and concentrated on kits. And I'm seeing Frostline opening up a, a, a store every, every couple of months, you know, and they're spreading throughout the West. And, so on and so forth, and I know Jim Cack, he diversified into the kit business. I said, this thing is gonna, gonna really grow. So I uh, scraped together a little money. I got a few people that had worked for us at Camp 7, and I got a couple people that worked at Frostline, a couple people that worked at Holly Bar, and I started a company called Altra Kits. And our whole concept was to market to retail stores. George and I had set up a heck of a distribution network in every college town in the country, in every good specialty store, uh, like Mountain Sports, we'd go to Ann Arbor or we'd go to Madison and we'd find the comparable store. And I knew all these people around the country, so we had a, we had a natural in. And we pulled together a group of products, went out there and got distribution there, got distribution with L.L. Bean and so on and so forth. But then something happened after we had gotten this thing off the ground. Dale Johnson decides that he's going to sell Frostline to a small company in Boston called Gillette. <laughs> and Jim Cack decides that he's going to sell Hollybar to a small uh, company in Racine, Wisconsin, named Johnson's Wax. So here's Altra Kits that has just gotten off the ground and is out there promoting this concept. And our two only competitors were Gillette and Johnson's Wax. <laughs> well, it was a challenge, believe me. It was a real challenge. I had a whole bunch of wonderful people. We built it and we ran it for 10 years. But then things started to change in this industry. And if you think back, what was starting to happen back there, number one, women were starting, this was, this was we started it in 75, and, and to, into the 80s, women started going back to work, and cheap imports really started to flood in from China. That was the beginning of the floodgate of getting things into this country from, from uh, the Chinese. And that cut our, the differential. We used to save people 30 to 50%. Uh, that was no longer the case. And there were some products that were coming in that at first weren't very great, but they got better and better and, and so on. So um, we decided after, after 10 years that we would get out of the recreational business and it was, a, uh, it was a tough decision on our part. We, we sold it off to a company back in Indiana that was selling to schools. That was one of our channels of distribution, where people would, would take these into sewing classes. They did this in Boulder for years, 
Uh, but we, we had a network of, of schools out there, and there was a company that used to sell sweatshirt kits. So they came along, and, and we sold that business. And that was my run of 15 years in the recreational business. I sat around and said, well, geez, what am I going to do next? And just as a postscript, I found a little company out in uh, Gun Barrel who uh, had an ankle bracelet that they sold to, or they wanted to sell, but they didn't have any sales and marketing. So I went over there and I uh, got into a totally different market, which was the corrections market. I joined BI over there and um, spent uh, 12 years with BI, which was a heck of a lot of fun. But I look back on my time in the recreational area, a uh, lot of wonderful people uh, that were competitors, wonderful people that were customers, um, and a lot of pe wonderful people that uh, had a chance to work, we had a chance to work together. And I'm real proud to be part of uh, some of the early days of this industry. Thank you. Next is Bill Forrest, Forrest Mountaineering. He lives in Salida now, he was manufacturing in Denver. Take it away. The only person on the agenda tonight uh, didn't come from Boulder. But I sold equipment to a lot of these guys and got a lot of good advice from these guys. Normally when I talk to an audience, uh, I give a slideshow and I just uh, click the button and I talk about these clients. <laughs> and uh, I'm not doing that tonight, so I brought a prop. <laughs> and the prop is a, a harness, which is one of the first products that I designed. I designed it because we used to tie in around the waist and when you fell it hurt. <laughs> and uh, when I climbed in Germany, uh, we tied around the shoulders and the, the chest and that hurt, hurt even more. So after many, many falls, I decided I would change that and uh, worked on developing a harness. Uh, I have been around Boulder for a long time. My dad was a surveyor for the Bureau of Land Management, worked on the Big Thompson project up at Estes Park. When I was a kid, I used to hike on the trails in Rocky Mountain National Park. Once in a while, I'd see these guys coming off a big piece of rock with a big rope around uh, their shoulders and all this jangling hardware coming by me. I didn't know what it was, but it looked really exciting. And I just loved the mountains because I'd spent all the summers that I had uh, with my father in the mountains up in Mr. Park uh, or in Grand Lake uh, when the big Thompson project was going on. So uh, after we finished that project, I, I got very involved in team sports. And because I was somewhat tall in those days and fairly fast, I loved basketball. So that was where I put all my energy into basketball. But then uh, when I was 19, I was in the service in Germany, and I had a good friend who was a climber. He climbed in the Tetons. And uh, he started telling me about how you tie the rope in, and then you put in a piece of protection, and then you clip in a carabiner, and you clip your rope to it, and you climb above that, say, five feet. And if you fall, you only fall 10 feet, and then your buddy holds a rope for you. I thought, gee, that's really neat. So he took me out to a place called Pete's Rock in Salt Lake City. And we, uh, we did a pitch and I just loved it. That was the end of basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I totally hooked on climbing. And I have been ever since. I just love to climb. Uh, so I was in the army for three years in Germany. I climbed almost every weekend with German climbers and uh, got all my climbing gear. I was all outfitted. And I was using the German uh, tie-in system where you tie in around the chest with one uh, strand over your shoulder. And every time you'd fall, it would just be this huge impact on your chest. And I was young and crazy, and I fell a lot. And I just hated to fall because of the, it was so painful. Then uh, I got back to the States, and people were using this tie around the waist. So I tried that, and it was fairly painful, not quite as bad as around the chest. It's still not very good. And then the Swami Bell came in, it was one inch tubular webbing, 17 feet of it wrapped around the waist and tied with a ring bend knot. And then it was around the waist when you'd fall. It was just the same as uh, having the bowline on the coil around the waist. It was terrible. Well, as I progressed in climbing, uh, I was in Arizona. I came back from Germany. I went to school at Arizona State, and I climbed in the desert around uh, Tempe, Arizona. And there was this big volcanic core uh, south of Tucson, about 60 miles near the Mexican border. And it's a peak called Babo Kibri Peak. 
It's got an east face on it. It's all 1,500 vertical feet and overhang, and it had never been climbed. So my buddy and I decided we were going to do it. And uh, after five attempts, we finally got up. And in the process, I developed a climbing harness. And I thought, everyone should have this thing. <laughs> because it's so much easier to do big wall climbs. It's so much easier on your body if you fall. It's very convenient for all types of rope work. And so I, I didn't know anything about sewing. I didn't have uh, all the background that some of these fellows here do in sewing. But I rented a sewing machine, and I <laughs> had a few mistakes, <laughs> broke a few needles. And I got a bar tag machine, which you didn't have to be very smart to run. You just <laughs> kick the pedal, and it takes off, sews 42 stitches, and you're done. Perfect. <laughs> That's my style. So I had this bar tag machine, and I developed this harness. And I sold a few to my friends. And they said, gee, Bill, why don't you go out and sell those things? So I thought, well, I, I'll do that. I think I'll start a business. I was teaching school in uh, Huron Junior High School in uh, North Plain at the time. And after school, I would go home and I'd sew these harnesses up. And I made a whole sack of these one day in, uh, I think it was in June 1968. And I put a dozen of these things in a paper bag. And I went up to Hoggy Bar, expecting one of the Hoggy Bars to be there. And I saw Jim Tack. He says, Bill, they're gone. I'm, I'm it. I said, well, Jim, will you buy this harness? <laughs> <laughs> he opened up the bag and he says, well, how much? And I said, well, you know, it's going to climbers. They don't have any money, so let's, let's be easy on these guys. He says, well, Bill, you got to charge more. <laughs> and he was right, because he had to make a buck, and I had to eventually pay insurance and employees and that type of thing. But Jim bought a dozen harnesses, and he was the first retail store in America to sell a uh, commercial climbing harness. Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> I had an outscored uh, down jacket on my first div whack on the uh, diamond. Oh, it was cold. <laughs> it wasn't a jacket, it was a sweater. <laughs> and my wife carries a controlled weight distribution pack. Uh, John Heimbach was uh, instrumental in uh, selling my company when I sold it to Dick Olson in 1985. I started making these harnesses in 68 and actually had the business for 20 years before I sold it to Dick. Dale Johnson came into my company one time and he said, Yeah, Bill, I'll, I'll talk to you guys about running an outdoor company. And he gave my staff a wonderful lecture about running an outdoor business. And then he gave his story. And it was very true. He said, you know, I was going up this old dirt road in the mountains of Utah. And I was having a hard time keeping up enough steam in my car to make this hill. And then I got behind this big truck. And the truck would stop halfway up the hill. And the guy would jump out. He'd run around the back and hit the back of the truck with a baseball bat. And run around and get back in the truck. And then he'd go another 100 yards and do the same thing again. And he'd do this five or six times until he got to the top of the hill. Then he pulled over at the top of the crest, and I, I pulled up that bike and said, hey, why are you doing that? He says, well, there's a bunch of chickens back in the back, and when I hit the back of the truck, they fly up in the air, and then I say, oh. <laughs> 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 and, and that's what it's like when you're in business, <laughs> which was very true. Um, <clears throat> but as all you fellows have said, uh, one of the greatest things about being in the outdoor business is the, uh, the people. Uh, Gary Neptune came into my shop when I actually had a factory. I ran my shop out of my house for five years, and I had just moved into a place in an industrial park, and I was official. I had a business license and everything, and Gary came in in, I think, 73, and uh, he wanted to buy some climbing gear. Of course, I'm ready for that. And uh, Gary bought a whole bunch of harnesses and climbing nets and net trays and all this climbing gear. Then he pulled out a check and wrote me a check. Now that's the kind of customer you want. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. And Gary and Jim, yeah, these guys are the best pay A accounts, best guys you can ever deal with. Wonderful people. Well, I ran the business for 20 years. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I couldn't wait to get to work every day. There was uh, always something good or new, exciting happening. We had new designs all the time, and that's really what I like to do, was work on new designs. And after I sold the business, I did some John Heinbach work and I did some consulting. And then I uh, developed another product. It was a snowshoe, 
which I sold to MSR. If any of you uh, use a Denali snowshoe or now a Lightning snowshoe, those are snowshoes that I designed for MSR. I worked for them in 10 years and retired in 2005. And uh, Rosa and I live in Salida now, and we just enjoy the mountains. Thank you. Is there any way you can get the microphone? No, it's all screwed up. <laughs> I was working perfect at 5 p.m. This is Dave Robertson. Many of you locals know Dave and Jan Robertson. Dave's claim to fame in terms of tonight, he was Hollybar employee number one at the Hollybar's home in the summer of 1954. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you back away so I could rent you one of my hearing aids if you want. <laughs> I accept. <laughs> I was first out here in 1953, Room was out of college that semester, Room with Dale and my brother, on North Broadway, and they uh, they were climbing. I didn't know squat about it, but uh, they took me with them, and so we taught in the the uh, Colorado Mountain Club climbing school. I think that was my third time out, but that's when I met my wife to be in 1953 for the first time, and uh, went back to school. And uh, Roy Hollybar got hold of me. Uh, near the end of that semester and said, would you like to work for us this summer? I think they were getting a little tired. They had the business on uh, 1215 Grandview. So I came out from Pennsylvania, lived in their basement, and the distinction between employee and family was, was pretty indistinct because I was living in their basement, Alice was cooking all the food, and I was doing everything that came along, whether that was stealing boxes from the liquor bar, <laughs> or filling orders, going out to the ranch to uh, pick up pitons from Bob Booning, the Mac blacksmith there that made pitons for Hollya Bar, pretty famous pitons, and uh, did all sorts of things. Of course, waited on customers. Hollya Bars at that point had the North American distributorship for Norwegian fishnet underwear. They also had the North American distributorship for Molitor boots, which were leather. Those are both ski boots and climbing boots. And uh, Roy was a very cautious guy, but sort of a risk taker also. And uh, Alice now is the real spark plug of this thing. And long before they got the ping pong table, Alice would be cutting out multiple designs in her living room, you know, what six or eight layers with these huge shears on priceless Indian rugs going like this. <laughs> and uh, she had me doing that too. It was amazing trust. It was pretty foolish actually. <laughs> the other things I did that summer were they, uh, I didn't know much about it, but there was a big rock over what might have been a spring in the vacant lot next door. And Rob Roy said, can you blow that up? And I said, sure. So I <laughs> went down to Valentine's Hardware and bought some dynamite and caps and <laughs> fuse and went back and made a mud pack and blew up his rock for him. And, well, I did have a pebble in the mud pack and uh, some guy came over and he was thought it was, had been pretty hard on his car window about six blocks away. <laughs> but, uh, but the rock was broken and Roy defended me. <laughs> then I think one other time, this, this is mountaineering business, of course. And they were running low on uh, beef, so we went out to the ranch and said, you know how to butcher a cow? And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so they went out with us, and we, so we shot and butchered the steer and uh, came back with it. So it was an interesting summer. <laughs> now, I'd like to read you a little bit, just to give you the flavor, and it's a, it's a little different than the other people, and I, my time in this business was very short, but it was very different. And this is from an end of the trail, an obituary, if you will, written by my wife about Alice. We, they were close family friends. And this, okay, now if you can just hold still for a minute, I'll get you measured. First the shoulders, 
Well, I can't promise, but I'll sure start to work on this barca first thing. High-pitched, steamy whistle. Lindy, that's the daughter, will you turn the pressure cooker down? Now let's cook with two pressure cookers, by the way. Now, where was I? The waist, doorbell rings. Come in, John, I'll be ready to go over that German with you in just a few minutes. Can you make yourself comfortable in the living room? All righty, now what color would you like this barca to be? Phone rings. Excuse me, hello, no, this is Alice. Roy isn't here right now. Will you bring your primus over and we'll have a look at it? Bye. Now, if you really think you can't wait to leave for the tea time, so why don't you just come over tomorrow about two and maybe, well, we'll have it finished. Knock on door. Why, kiddo, how are you? Gosh, gee, happy to see you. No, no, we're not any busier than usual. Can you stay for lunch? Looky here, we've got lunch just about made, Lindy and me. And we'll eat in about 45 minutes, as soon as I can get John there straight on his German, please. You just come back for lunch. Bye, yes. I don't know if I can do it, but we'll sure give her a try. Two tomorrow. And in the days when Hollybar Mountaineering was in the Hollybar home in 1215 Grandview, the rush order parker would have been completed in 26 hours. John would have been straightened out in his German, eventually passed his doctoral language requirement. His customer's primus would have been clean and working again. And the friend would have enjoyed a lunch of homemade beef soup, fresh baked bread, probably from one I killed, and a slice of apples, cherry, torque, all of which seemed to be freshly chilled in her refrigerator. That gives you a little bit of a sense what it was like that summer in the sparkle that Alice had. She was an amazing, amazing woman, and I treasure those days forever. So, thank you. Dale Johnson. I came to Boulder in 1949 and uh, started college and immediately got into the rock climbing scene. And that ultimately led me to all of these guys, one way or the other. Uh, and while I was in college and, and climbing, the major outlet for climbing equipment was Leroy and Alex Hollybar's uh, basement. And I remember, I'll never forget, the one summer when they imported a Yanel Ture down jacket, the first down jacket anybody had ever seen. And it was made out of this gossamer nylon. This was before Ripstop. But we'd go down there and we'd stroke it. <laughs> <laughs> it was so soft. It was so sensitive. <laughs> After uh, college, uh, I was. Uh, unlike, unlike George and some of my other friends who had the sense to volunteer for the uh, Mountain Cold Weather Training Command and get some cushy jobs, <laughs> I went kicking and screaming into the Army when they drafted me uh, about a year after I graduated from uh, uh, college. I managed to finish college on deferments. And uh, after a couple of years in the Army, then I was back uh, in Boulder again. I had uh, achieved a BA in geology and uh, started hunting for a job. Finally got one with a little tiny oil company in Denver. And I was lucky because uh, my geologist buddies that all graduated with me were all selling pencils on the street corners. Now you're going to have to take some of this with a grain of salt, including what these guys say. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I worked for the oil company for a while, actually for about three years. And it was an experience that I did not ever want to repeat because I was always either in the office looking at uh, well logs and minute microscopic cuttings through the microscope, or we were out in the field on some awful well in western Nebraska, and everything on a well happens at night, it seems. Mm -hmm. So after a few of those, I said, that, you know, I just, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I've got to do something else. Enter Jerry Cunningham. Jerry had been in business at that point from about 1947 or so. 45. 46. 45, right after the Second World War when he got out of the Army. And Jerry's business was growing, and at the time, all of his stuff was being sowed, the, the things that he was manufacturing, were being sowed by uh, people in their homes. He would pay them so much for sleeping bag or tent or whatever it was that they were making. 
And my wife at the time was one of his sewers. And uh, we became good friends. And then Jerry finally decided that he had to have more production than he could get out of all of his uh, lady sewers around town. And he asked me to join him and open a sewing factory. Well, I knew nothing about sewing factories, but why not? And in order to support this sewing factory, we decided that we had to open a retail store also so that we'd have enough cash flow to pay the seamstresses, I presume. Anyway, this, this whole thing went along pretty well. George Lamb then worked for me for a while. He became one of the sewers. And uh, George is one of our star sewers because he knew how to sew before he ever got out of high school. <laughs> <coughs> so we sewed up a lot of product like that for several years, opened a store up on uh, Broadway, had a store on Pearl Street. And uh, uh, an interesting time there, one of the things that, that Jerry did was also periodically land a contract from the United States Air Force for uh, various and sundry things. One, the most important one, which was a downfield survival suit. In those days, as now, really, I guess, for example, in the Strategic Air Command, those bombers were ro roving all over the world. Tomorrow, they might be in, uh, over uh, South America someplace, and the day after tomorrow, they might be flying the North Pole. So they had to have some sort of a garment which would fit all sizes, and uh, could be back and back into an extremely small space. So Jerry and I developed this down suit, which, and I was 6'2 at the time, it shrunk a little since then. <laughs> it would fit me, and it would also fit Bob Swartz. <laughs> Bob Swartz is you know, sometimes, and he's only about that tall. And so we would go out on lecture tours with this thing, and, uh, and show how Bob could wear it, and then he'd hand it to me, and I'd undo a bunch of ties, and then I'd put it on. And we developed a way to back and pack this thing into the seat bottom of ejection seats. And it was just, I mean, you could hammer nails with it, except it wasn't hitting it. <coughs> so uh, Jerry and I worked together. Uh, I mean, just, uh, we ran this uh, sewing factory, I finally got run the ropes on sewing factories, an experience of about eight years, which taught me one thing that uh, I, I never forgot, and that is I never, ever wanted to run a sewing factory again. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> After about eight years, Jerry and I had a big falling out, and I learned another lesson. Early on in our association, we formed a corporation called Jerry Mountain Sports Incorporated. And by the way, Penny, the original Jerry thing was called Jerry Incorporated. Jerry Mountain Sports wasn't formed until Jerry and I got together, opened this sewing factory and, and stores in Boulder. So when we incorporated, Jerry was a little smarter than he was. Well, he had founded the business, so he got 51% and I got 49%. So after eight years, we had this big falling out. Jerry fired me. I'm out on the street. What am I going to do? So I went to Denver and pounded the pavement for a while, and finally went to work for a bank, the largest bank in Denver at the time, the Denver United States National Bank. Had over 800 employees. Had this 20-story building downtown. And I went into that, just like a college graduate, into their training program, where they shunted me from department to department two or three months at a time all the way through the bank. It was, on, it was really on an uh, uh, executive track, I guess, like a management track. And it was there uh, where I uh, became acquainted with computers. Now, in those days, computers occupied entire rooms like this. And um, I remember the computer at the Denver US sat at the back of the lobby, a great glass wall. And behind it were all these magical and people would go back there and watch that. And what they were watching were the tape drives. You know, the tapes in those days, the drives were on big spool. I mean, the tape was on big spools about like that. And they, they jerked like this, you know. <laughs> and what was happening, of course, the computer was reading off of those tapes, and the tapes were about, I don't know, two inches wide. The computer itself was just an innocuous box 
sitting over there doing nothing. Nobody, nobody ever thought that was a computer. Nothing to see, no moving parts. And, uh, but that was computers in those days. So anyway, I learned how useful computers could be, uh, how they could be programmed. Uh, in those days, it had to be, you'd write a program and key punch it on what used to be called an IBM machine on IBM cards. And then that was read into the computer and it would be recorded on this two inch wide magnetic tape. Anyway, what I really learned was that computers were tools for anybody, not just big corporations. So after three years with the bank, I decided that I had to get out of there. The thing that really drove me out was that I found out that this bank considered every person in the bank a salesperson for that bank. And the culmination of that was a a big uh, drive for new business, bringing in new checking accounts, and we were all assigned goals. We were asked what our goal would be, and if we had no idea, we were given a goal. And we were told, you got to bring this in. And so, uh, so we all worked at that, and uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the head of the uh, auditing department flat quit over that one, he just said. Forget. I'm not going to be a salesman. But it also drove me away. I thought, how can I get out of this? What's my escape plan? <coughs> Back when Jerry and I were together, Jerry tried sew-it-yourself kits. Well, not exactly sew-it-yourself kits, because his approach to the kit, uh, outdoor equipment kit, uh, was such that it was really difficult for the customer to do. His plan was he. he, he had the garment, let's say he's going to make a park. It would be on a piece of paper, about eight and a half by eleven, maybe, all good, and it was on, on draft paper as well. And the customer then had to expand that up to, say, butcher paper to the size that he or she wanted. Buy the necessary amount of cloth, lay this plan out on the cloth, cut it out, buy everything, and then sew it together. I mean, it was just impossible. But a lot of people were interested in it. And so I thought, with all the interest in that kid business, maybe there's an easier way to do this. So I finally figured out how to, that, 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 that the key to it was to pre-cut all of the parts for each size and color for everything. And uh, I started out in 1966 with six kids. I hand drew all of my uh, instructions, and I had a, a little brochure printed up, and uh, mailed it off. And uh, well, first thing I did, though, I, I backtracked this a little bit. I placed a couple of ads. Uh, I think one in the uh, Sierra Club Journal at that time. They were still taking ads, and uh, uh, and in the meantime, I'm still working at the bank. And then along about May. To my assessment, orders actually started coming. <laughs> and uh, so, in a sense, I was off and running. I mean, you know, I could get two orders today, and maybe day after tomorrow, I get four. And, uh, but it gradually grew. So, after about six or eight months, finally working days at the bank and nights at home, uh, my, uh, my wife had a cleaning lady that came in every couple of weeks. And she said, Mr. Johnson, you're working yourself to death. I used to work for uh, Sears and Roebuck in their uh, mail order department, and I think I know pretty much how to do what you're doing. And so I hired her on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, after, after work each night, I would cut out all of this stuff. I, I'd made some cutting tables in the basement. I'd cut out the things and leave them in stacks. And she would come in the next morning and pack all the stuff, package it all up. And on, on her way to work, she had to go right by the mail, uh, the post office. So she'd pick up the orders that they were in. And then, uh, so after packaging all these kits, then she'd open the orders, put all the money and the stuff on my desk, and then she'd fill the orders, package it all up, and put it into the, take it to the mailbox or the post office on her way home. So it worked like a charm. And then one day, uh, she gets, I get this phone call from, let's say, her name is Armand Henson. And 
she says, oh, Mr. Johnson, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, <laughs> I have no idea. Adrenaline rush, a thousand scenarios go through my mind. Well, what's the matter? I've got 20 orders today, and I don't know how I can fill them all. <laughs> well, if you can't get them all filled, you know, today, fill the rest tomorrow. What if I get more tomorrow? <laughs> I will deal with that when it happens. <laughs> anyway, the business started growing. And I finally had to make the decision, was I going to be in the banking business, or was I going to be in the kit business? And it was a no-brainer, really, for me anyway, because <clears throat> I hate working for other people. So, and I quit the bank three months before uh, my share of the uh, retirement program was fully vested. I just left the money there and left. I had to get to work. And for the next six months, I worked seven days a week. I almost never left the basement. <laughs> After that, uh, Frostline pretty well grew by leaps and bounds. It doubled in, in gross sales and in profits. Every year, now double or nothing is still nothing. Started out with about 25,000 the first year. Went to over 50,000, went to over 100,000, and on and on it went. After 10 years, this thing is really on a roll. In the meantime,